Over the past few weeks, we've had the privilege to learn from some exceptional clinicians. They are at the forefront of dentistry, and not only are they pushing dentistry forward, but they're passionate about teaching and giving back to us. So to all the speakers, I wanna say a special thank you for inspiring us. I've been taking lots of notes and I can't wait to get back to work and implement everything that I have learned. I'm gonna start by talking about the key steps that I took in placing my first implant in June of 2018 to now having placed several hundred implants, all in less than two years. I hope to answer some of the most common questions that we have and that I receive uh, regarding getting into implant dentistry. For those of you who uh, recognize this, this is the University of Western Ontario and this is where my career started out. I graduated in 2016. I can't believe it's gonna be almost four years uh, this June and time flies. So in terms of implant exposure while in school, it's fairly limited. We had a couple courses to uh, restoring implants. Uh, we got to treatment plan a case, do a surgical guide, watch an implant being placed. I never got that opportunity and then restore a few implants. But at that time, I honestly didn't even really care. Uh, I thought uh, implants is something that specialists do. I was more focused on what am I doing next? For me, that ended up a, being a GPR, a general practice residency at The Ohio State University College of Dentistry. A shout out to my attendings, Dr. Turbo and Dr. Reed, as well as my co-residents who were just a phenomenal group of individuals and I learned so much. Also, go Buckeyes. Uh, crazy going to these football games, 100,000 people packed into a stadium. Um, sorry for those of you joining me from University of Michigan. So I got a great opportunity to learn about hospital dentistry, uh, medically compromised patients, patients who had a medication list three, four, five, six pages long. I had rotations with dental anesthesiologists for a month. Uh, we were working in the OR on patients under GA. And then we had the opportunity to do our own IV sedation cases. And that's where I became very comfortable with this modality. And that's why I offer it regularly now. We took out a lot of teeth. There'd be some days I'd go home and my hand was cramping up just because of the sheer number I took the teeth uh, I would take out, especially on those OR days. And this got me comfortable with the basics of oral surgery. In terms of implants, I, I was able to restore quite a few and I became more familiar with the restorative aspects of implant uh, dentistry. And we were on a rotation with the perio residents to uh, learn placement uh, of these implants as well. But even at this time, I didn't know when I was gonna be placing implants. I didn't know what the path was gonna look like and I didn't know how long it was gonna take. I was thinking five, six years out. At that time, I was more focused on getting a job. I started out by associating at three offices in Windsor, Ontario. I also wanna give a shout out to Dr. Kent Howie at Ambassador Dental for giving me my first opportunity. So ideally we'd like to work at one practice and be busy from day one. It doesn't always work out that way, but that's okay. For me, this ended up being a huge blessing in disguise. I got to learn the different office protocols, the strengths and weaknesses of different offices. I was able to use different endo systems, different materials, uh, different crown cements, and this accelerated my learning at a whole new level. I was doing different types of treatment. One office, I would take out a lot of teeth all day long. At another office, I was cutting crowns every time I was there and everything in between. This helped me with my speed and helped me to adapt to the type of treatment I wanted to offer. Most importantly, and the thing that has played a big role now is I had access to different patient populations. So at one office, 99% insurance based. At another office, uh, social assistance or government assistance, I should say. And at that time, I didn't appreciate it, but there was value in that. I was learning how to do quadrant dentistry. I was learning how to improve my efficiency. So there's always opportunity in, in anyone that you treat. And then the key to why I've been able to place a few hundred implants uh, in less than two years is these now, these associateships act as my referral base. By maintaining good relationships with the principal dentist, the staff, and the patients at these offices, I now have a referral base of five, six, seven thousand 7,000 patients uh, for my implant placement. This is what my schedule looked like in August of 2017. Again, it's not ideal. I wish I was a little bit busier, but there's opportunity in this. For those of you who are just graduating, you're not gonna start out being as busy as you want to be, especially with the current situation. That is okay. There's gonna come a time where you're so busy 
that you don't even have time to think. So make the most of this. And how do we make the most of this? We look at this as an opportunity instead of a setback. You're gonna be moving a little bit slower in the office, maybe not as many hygiene checks. We're not running from op to op. So when we graduate, we're a little bit slower. Let's use this time to take, uh, to get better at our treatment uh, without having to rush. Use the downtime to learn from your mentors. Take online CE and practice those procedures that you struggled with in school. You now can give undivided attention to that molar endo or placing your first implant. Most importantly, and something that I've been practicing while I'm seeing my emergency patients a handful a day, is I'm laying the foundation and building the relationship with my patients. I'm spending time and giving time to know them. Uh, or giving time to, to get to know them better. And what this is doing is, is setting the foundation, it's building trust for future uh, treatment. For some reassurance, my phone's been uh, blown up off the hook. De uh, patients are looking to get back into uh, the dental offices. So not only is dentistry surviving, it will be thriving soon. Along my journey, I ended up working at 600 Tecumseh Dental and Barjet Smile Center, 600 Tecumseh Dental, which I now co-own with Dr. Shurgan. And this is a unique concept. This is an office where we have a long-standing experienced denturist and a general dentist office all in one roof, different staff, uh, different patient populations, um, different systems, but all under one roof to provide that seamless care for our patients. That's where I met this young man, Tom Barjet and his associate, Charles Lim, two exceptional denturists with significant experience working with implant-supported and retained prosthesis. Together, they've done over a few thousand implant-related cases. For those of you who know Dr. Steve Bungard, Tom started out with him practicing the all-in-four concept over 10, years, over 10 years ago. So they have a lot of experience. And then this is where I started to see these cases and the differences it made to their patients how life-changing these treatments truly were. I could hear the praise coming down the hallways and finally it hit me. I needed to place implants so my patients like me as much as they like Tom and Charles. For those of you who don't have dentures in your office, go connect with one who has experience working with implants. They will greatly increase your ability to focus on the treatment you want to provide and allow them, uh, uh, and allow them to make the most of the prosthetic component. For me, this is the biggest secret as why I was able to uh, place so many implants in such a short time. So a special shout, shout out to Mark Chan and uh, Adam McCabe who gave great lectures on implant supported prosthesis. So I had my why. I saw how patients quality of life improved drastically with these implant supported prosthesis. Patients were satisfied with their treatment. They had so much confidence going out in public. Uh, the one thing that I remember in the, in the beginning was especially older women who would meet with their friends or family once or twice a week. Uh, they no longer had to cover their mouth while they were talking uh, because they were confident. They didn't have to worry about their dentures slipping out or not being able to chew. Speaking of which, with diet, we're normally crushing our food uh, with traditional dentures. With a little bit more stability, we can get a, a more of a chewing action. This reduces the size of the food that we swallow, and then we in turn have uh, less of a um, less of uh, a upset stomach. Speech and taste for upper dentures, we can go ahead and remove the acrylic that covers the palate in some cases, and this allows you to talk better. Your tongue can touch the palate at different points while you're talking, and you can taste your food better. The most important thing out of all of this is no more glue, and this is the thing that I think patients are the most happiest about. So we all already know the benefits to implants. Uh, I take out a lot of teeth every single day and unfortunately sometimes it is bridges. And it's not that it was bad dentistry, it's, it's good dentistry that's lasted 10, 15, 20, sometimes even longer. But when it fails, it can be disastrous to the patient. And now a patient is left with feeling like they're missing a whole piece of their mouth. So that's an, uh, that was another point for me where I wanted to place implants. And then you give patients a lot of confidence when you're offering this type of treatment. Uh, I often ask after I do an implant procedure, did you forget that the implants are there? And they'll usually say, yeah. And that's a sign that they've moved on with their life and they're confident with their oral health. But it's not only confidence for patients, you should have confidence for yourself. You should be confident in offering a predictable and highly successful procedure.
no matter what, this is a prosthetically driven treatment. We must always keep that in mind. And I think it's a good treatment to, for us to offer inside of our offices. Um, we do so many other procedures. Why not, uh, why not offer patients a chance to get that molar implant and, and, and uh, offer that treatment? We are already taking out the molars right in our offices. Uh, so practice a little bit of socket grafting, place that implant. And this makes patients feel very comfortable. They like being around staff that they're familiar with. They like being around the dentist they're familiar with. And if we can't deliver something at the highest level, then of course we have a responsibility to refer these patients to our specialist colleagues. Let's use digital dentistry to break down some of these barriers to make implant dentistry easier. We can now, from start to finish, treatment planning to restoring implants, we can do it all in-house. There is a little bit of an investment to get in, into implant dentistry and that's okay. In a matter of a few cases, if they're done well and planned well, you'll make it back. The global dental implant market was about 4 billion in 2018. It's now 8 billion in 2026, or it's projected to be. I don't know about you guys, but I want a piece of that. And the way I'm going to do that is by training myself, educating myself and offering patients the highest level of care that I can provide. We have an aging population, especially here in Canada. And this is the market that I see is gonna want implants the most. They are living healthier, active lifestyles than the generations before them. They're not gonna accept compromise. They want the best care possible and implants will give that to them. So I now had my why. I knew why I wanted to place implants, but how do I get started? So continuing education and, 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 that's, and a lot of training. Dr. Stephen Diana did a great job of articulating the path to implant dentistry with his lecture on Tuesday. I'll be giving you the CE route that I took. Those of you who are using your spare time to uh, be online uh, learning forums uh, and, and modes of learning, that is the most important step. To me, CE is not necessarily just taking a course, getting a certificate and moving on with your life. It's as a collective, all the time and energy you are investing into gaining a new skill. And in my opinion, the best way of doing that is with a mentor. A mentor will guide you on your journey, provide you reassurance and confidence when you need it the most, they'll give you tips and tricks, let you learn from their mistakes, all while allowing you to watch them place implants. I strongly encourage everyone to reach out to those around you who are placing implants to see if you can shadow. There are also mentorship programs available from programs such as Dentistry Academy and implant mentorship programs from Dr. Sheikh's Ontario Dental Implant Network, as well as Dr. Diana's peer-to-peer -peer training. I was so fortunate to meet these two guys right out of uh, finishing my residency. And they played a huge role in the trajectory that uh, my career is headed on. So a big thanks to these guys. And they weren't only excellent dentists, very accommodating. They placed a lot of implants and they also know how to uh, own and run a, a business or two. So I would come in on my weekdays after my other associate positions, like Dr. Shergan was mentioning at the beginning, or 8 a.m. On, uh, on Saturday mornings. I would go into 600 to come see dental and I would watch them place implants for these denture cases. I would try to make it to the office before them, help prepare their patients by getting them numb, do a full mouth clearance, do some alveoplasty. I would let them jump in, do the implant surgery. And I then had courtside seats to their implant placement. I did this for six months before I even took my first implant course. And I was so familiar with the process by the time it came to implement this knowledge. Once I started placing implants, I continued to shadow them and I still do to this day. Starting out, I would set up implant cases for when they were in the office. They would see their patients, I would see mine. This gave me confidence and comfort to always push and always work at my limits. If something was beyond my limits, I would then have them do the case and I would watch and learn. Later on, I met some of these guys here, specifically uh, Dr. Mian Quek and Dr. Jeff Sumner uh, as a part of the Dentistry Academy. And I was able to learn more about um, oral surgery in general, whether it's taking out teeth or placing implants. And they go hand in hand. You need to be good at taking out teeth to be able to offer good implant treatment. Dr. Steven did a good job of going through this document. I strongly suggest everyone get very familiar with this. This is the guidelines and the minimum keyword, the minimum requirements we need to offer treatment for simple cases. It's a good read in the sense that it, it helps you understand what you need to do uh, to offer uh, implant care in your practice. 
My favorite part about all of this is on the RCBSO membership uh, resource center, there is a e-portfolio where I keep track of all my CE. Um, it's a great way just to uh, keep track of the documentation and for those 90 credits that you need every three years, um, it's just uh, another platform to keep track of all of that. So this is my CE journey. It started in 2018. This is not all the CE I took, and this is not the right or the wrong way of doing it. This is just my journey, and I hope that you will learn from it. I'll also go over some cases, not ideal cases, but cases that I look back and I learn from. January of 2018, I'm taking a intro to uh, implant placement course, the didactic portion. A few months later, we're doing the live patient hands-on. And in between these two case uh, courses, I was immediately looking for patients during my recare exams. Anytime I took out teeth, I was grafting. Um, anytime I had an emergency exam, restorative, I was talking to patients, I was planting a seed for implant treatment. And I did this so well that not only did I have patients for my hands-on course, but I had 20 single molar implant cases lined up the moment I had my requirements. And that kept me busy for a few weeks afterwards. Here is an example of one of those first cases. Super simple, ASA 1, ASA 2. Um, the patient was already missing a 3-6 for a couple of years. Great tissue, great bone. To make things a little bit more interesting, I had to remove the 4-6 uh, due to a failed root canal at the same time. So very basic stuff here. Um, I used a alginate model, or I used uh, an alginate impression to pour up the model. I uh, used a suck down tray to make my initial guide for the osteotomy. This is the placement and checking with a guide pin. Angulation looks okay, could be a little bit better. It's going a little, it's tipping towards the distal a little bit. Sorry for the uh, angulation of the PA there. I took a pan because I wanted to see not only how the implant looks, but because I took out the four, six and grafted, I just wanted to see the bone material. But this is a great way to look and learn and reflect uh, on what I could have done differently. So now after listening to Dr. Azeem Sheikh's immediate molar lecture, I would have done a 4-6 immediate implant. But looking back at the 3-6, the placement is okay. It could be a little bit more bodily uh, moved to the, to the mesial, I should say. And I could have placed it a little bit more subcrestal. That would have given uh, this case a, a better uh, emergence profile. However, this patient has been long uh, since restored and, and he's doing just fine. And he's very happy with his, with his treatment. For me, I was around dentures a lot. I needed to learn. So I would take courses with my uh, friend and uh, dentures, Charles Lim, and we learned more about uh, denture stabilization. He already knew all this stuff, but I think he just came along for moral support. I was still focusing on getting better as a clinician in terms of oral surgery. So we took courses related to that, to that and that was with Dentistry Academy. I continued to focus on implants and dentures because that's what I was seeing. That was the need for the position I was in and I needed to fulfill that need. I needed to learn how to treat these patients. And I continued with that by taking more courses as it relates to implants and a dentist patient. So it's now 2019 and I'm feeling pretty good. I'm feeling confident. I placed a good number of implants, but I'm still working with and learning from my mentors. However, I'm starting to come across cases where I don't actually fully appreciate or understand uh, the complexity of the cases. Then Dr. Steve Chang, who gave a great lecture this past Tuesday, introduced me to this concept, the Dunning-Kruger effect. And what this states is essentially those with a minimal amount of training think they're much better than they actually are. So loosely, we can describe it as you don't know what you don't know. And I was getting to that point. So I was somewhere around here, if you can see my mouse, so I was somewhere around here. And I knew I needed to drastically increase my uh, education into implant dentistry. I learned about the all in four concept by Dr. Palomalo, not because I was gonna go ahead and implement this treatment the next day, but I wanted to learn the skills I even needed to get to that point. So this laid the foundation for that. I had placed a number of implants in a short period of time, so none of them were actually suffering from periimplantitis, but I knew that was a possible complication and I need to know how to manage it. You need to be able to take care of these patients. We learned a little bit more about provisionalization of implants. Around this time, I'm still pushing myself. I'm still working on my limits and I'm doing cases like this. So this is a patient who was referred by the denturist, came down the hallway, and she needed dentures. She was a relatively healthy patient. Um, and 
I had discussed, anytime I'm talking to patients about implant, uh, sorry, denture treatment, it is a discussion about implants that follows immediately after. I discuss the benefits, the pros, the cons, uh, the alternative options, and I'm, I take pride in really educating them, and I spend a lot of time doing this. In this case, I wasn't doing a good job enough. She didn't want the implants right away. She just wanted these teeth taken out. They were flapping in the wind while she was talking to me. So we took this out really quickly, and this was done under local anesthetic, and she had a positive experience. The dentures took over and made sure she was comfortable with her dentures, and she was happy. Three or four months later, she came back to me and said, hey, can you tell me more about those implants we talked about? She wanted implants. So I went ahead and reviewed the consent. I placed these implants. The way I did it was I just used a pan. I had the denture. We cut holes out in the denture for where we wanted the implants. And then this uh, allowed, it allowed me to use the denture as a guide. Looking back on this case, I, I see a, a lot of things that we could have done better. At the time, I felt great. I was like, look, this is freehand. They look pretty straight. I'm feeling pretty good. But looking back at pictures like this, we have a lot to learn from. So the biggest thing that jumps out to me now is anterior posterior spread. The distance from the most anterior implant to the most posterior implants, uh, the, the further that spread is, the more stability the denture has. So I could have done that a little bit better. Uh, one thing that I think I could have also done better is the flap. In residency, I was comfortable with doing mandibular tori removal, but I hadn't worked too much around the mental nerve. So now I'm comfortable with that. And I think that would have also helped me place implants a little bit more posterior. Things I did well, I think the implants are placed at a good depth, meaning I placed them slightly subcortical. And I also reamed the bone around the area so I would have uh, no problem with seating the locator abutment. Luckily, right around this time, I took this course. It was Immediate Locators with Dr. Ho Young Chung, who's gonna give us an amazing lecture today in about half an hour or so. And with this, uh, I was a part of the Advanced Implant Residency by the Bites Institute. This is by Dr. Mark Kwan, uh, based out of Vancouver. And this was a structured way to learn more about the more advanced concepts in implant dentistry by a group of very talented, very passionate dentists. The, it, was a fi it was five modules over the course of eight or nine months. The second one was immediate interiors. I had done some interiors at that point, but I was learning how to do them better. Along with that, and not a part of the advanced implant residency, I learned about uh, PET or partial extraction therapy by Dr. Howard Gluckman. And this was just, uh, another way of making sure I was able to offer my patients the highest level of treatment. So around this time, I'm doing cases like this. I have a patient who has a very low small smile line. Aesthetics isn't a huge concern, but he's upset that his two tooth crown has fractured uh, and it's happened multiple times. He's had a one two implant placed by his specialist a couple of years ago, and he wanted an implant in two two. He's wearing a flipper. So I did a CBCT. I made a surgical pilot guide. And here's what we started off with. So we had a two tube uh, root canal tooth that needed to be extracted. Um, I sent the CBCT and a model to the lab. They merged that and I was able to design the uh, guide using um, a blue sky bio. To take out the tooth, I used this instrument and this is a life changer. If I had to pick one instrument in all of dentistry, it's this guy. And I had been using these type of instruments before but it was Dr. Ho Young Chung and uh, specifically Dr. Neki Jamal who introduced me to the Carl Schumacher brand of products. And they are such good instruments. I feel invincible when I have this in my hand. And uh, thanks to Dr. Neki Jamal who was giving us a great lecture this upcoming Friday, he's reached out to Carl Schumacher and everyone who's participating in these webinars gets a 20% discount. So check out their website. Um, Dr. Shergan and one of the co-hosts will be uh, posting the link and the promo code Jamal20 in the chat group. So go ahead and check these out. There's no uh, financial gain for everyone. This is just showing how Neki Jamal always wants to help those out around him. And this is one of those ways. Real quick, Jazz, it, the correction is it's Jamal, all caps, zero five. That's yes. the promo code. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay. So we have, uh, we have the initial uh, pilot uh, drill here to check the positioning of my, my osteotomy. It looks like it's completely at the apex, it's not. Anytime we're working at the uh, interior region, we wanna make sure we're working more palatally. We don't want the implant to go through the buckle. So I was happy with the placement. 
and we went ahead and placed the implant. Overall, it's okay. Yes, it looks a little bit close to uh, the adjacent tooth, but I believe that's more due to angulation. We had planned this out on the CBCT, and yes, I see the uh, decay on the caries that's been uh, on the uh, uh, adjacent canine that's now been resolved. And one of the biggest things uh, about this case and the take home for me was uh, I was doing this case on a day, I was getting my butt kicked kind of uh, by IV sedation wisdom tooth day. And it was just a tough day. Every case pr presented its, its own challenges. With this case, with this treatment planning, with this setup, this patient was in and out of the office in like 40 minutes. And he had such a positive experience, and it was just a really great way to end, to end that day. As we continue to place implants, we want to make sure we can manage the soft tissue around these implants. Tissue is the issue. You need to know how to modify this and be able to uh, um, take care of this aspect of implant dentistry. I learned advanced sinus lifting. I had already learned uh, a little bit about indirect sinus lifts from the Dentistry Academy. And this was just another step above, which uh, took us through the steps of how to do a sinus lift uh, through uh, a lateral window. And we practiced on an egg, which was really cool. You, uh, you blow out the yolk of the, the egg and you practice uh, drilling through the, uh, the shell and removing the, the membrane from the inside. And that's similar to what you would do for, for a lateral window sinus lift. So with this, we also learned about the cast kit from uh, Dr. Azim uh, Sheikh. So that's something I'm looking to learn, uh, learn about as well. So this provided me uh, more comfort when I was doing my indirect science lifts because I had a better understanding now. And then we finished off that advanced implant residency uh, with Dr. Steve Chang and Dr. Mark Kwan giving us a lecture on fully restoring an all on X case and just walking through the steps involved from surgery to restoration. This brought all these concepts together for me. And just one thing to note or point out, this is one, not all the CEI I took, it's just a, a small amount of it, but I was learning more and I was pushing myself, but the more I took, the more I recognized and understood my limits. So that is key to make sure we're aware of. Around that time, I'm doing cases like this, uh, where I am seeing patients who now lost a few teeth, they're in partials, um, and I've done my due diligence by educating them on implants, but sometimes patients just don't want it right away. This was one of those cases. Patient came back and he said, I can't do the removable uh, option anymore. And the partial dentures were fantastic. It just wasn't for him. So we had a patient who we were maintaining his periodontal status. He was following up, he was compliant, and I was comfortable with placing implants. More importantly, he had a very low smile line and you couldn't see his teeth when he talked. So then and even now, I very, very selectively pick the cases I get involved with. We took a CBCT, we used Blue Sky Bio to come up with this guide. This is a very rudimentary way of doing things, but I like the way that we had everything treatment planned before we even began. We went ahead and placed these implants and I checked to make sure the guide fit. We placed the implants. When it came to the implant in the 4-3 area, what happened was the guide wasn't 100% accurate. So I was able to remove the guide and place these implants, uh, place the one implant uh, just with my hand and it brain guided. And I'm glad I had the experience from previous cases to do this. So one of the best advantages of guided surgery is the efficiency, the accuracy and the speed. But you also wanna make sure you have the skills to address any concerns that arise during that surgery. So 2020, a lot had happened in the last two, uh, two years, and I was learning a lot of different concepts at these CE courses, uh, concepts and principles that I didn't even knew that existed, one of which was the osteodensification. Uh, this is the Densa Burr system uh, that is a set of uniquely designed burrs that spin in a counterclockwise direction, and they are used in indirect sinus lift, they are used in ridge augmentation, um, and implant stability. I took this course with uh, Dr. Jake Carrier, who has a course coming up on uh, May 28th. And he's brilliant, uh, an exceptional young dentist, so make sure everyone checks out his talk. Next, I learned about this concept, PRF. So I was already doing IV sedation. I had done some cases where I, uh, where I used sticky bone and I made the PRF membrane. And what this concept is, is essentially using the patient's own blood, you, uh, you draw it out, you spin it in a centrifuge and you use it for healing purposes. You use it in the sinus, you use it 
uh, in bone grafting and implant placement. And I knew I needed to learn it from the best. So I learned from this guy, Dr. Neki Jamal. So he was kind enough again to make sure we all get a 20% discount with the Carl Schumacher products. More importantly, he is a fantastic clinician and does a great job of teaching his course. I've taken a version of this a few months ago and it's very helpful. There's gonna be a lot of tips and tricks. So we hope to see everyone there. And then we started taking a CE uh, course on this for about eight to nine weeks now. And even during this uncertain and negative times, we have some positivity. We have Dentistry Academy, we have the fast track system to continue to learn and to continue to be inspired to do better and do more dentistry. Dr. Diana talked about having a CBCT in the office and so did uh, Dr. Zim Sheikh. I was in the process of getting all that set up. We had went ahead and pulled the trigger on getting CBCT. Literally this upcoming weekend, I was taking my certification course at the University of Western. Obviously it's been since delayed and, and I look forward to being able to get that done soon. Dentistry Academy had a course in mastering digital workflow in implant dentistry where Dr. Jeff Sumner was gonna go through uh, from A to Z on how to uh, treatment plan these cases using the help of uh, digital technology and how we could do this in our offices. So that's since been delayed. It's another course that I'm looking forward to. We learned a lot about immediate molars with Dr. Sheikh. That's something I definitely wanna learn more about in the future. Uh, I need to get better at uh, ridge augmentation. Again, you're always reflecting back and looking at the things you need to improve on. Dental photography, looking at all these speakers we've had this past uh, few weeks, I need to up my dental photography game. Not only will it help me uh, uh, plan my cases better, it'll help me educate others and educate patients. Uh, more importantly, I can go back and look and learn from my mistakes, so that's key. So we've done all the CE. Now, what should you do? What should we do when we get, get, are getting started? And this is a question I get pretty frequently. Start with online webinars and seminars. There's been a huge shift to online CE, and I think that is gonna continue, and it's, it, it has been continuing. It's, it's almost overwhelming how much information there is online. Just be critical of, of what it is that you take. Start by restoring implants. Get comfortable with the system you're restoring. Get comfortable with looking at a, an implant that was placed by someone else and seeing what a good implant looks like. In the meantime, you're still treatment planning. Every time you're taking out a tooth, you're, you're doing soccer preservation and you're setting these cases up. But until you can place it, refer to a mentor, refer to a principal dentist, refer to a specialist who will let you observe. And you're continuing with the soccer preservation, the very simple technique to get comfortable with the process of handling bone, doing sutures, and you learn so many valuable skills by practicing this. Go ahead and take your basic uh, implant, uh, intro to implant uh, courses to get your 70 hours. So what do we do after that? I think the best way to implement what you learn at a CE course is work with a mentor for your first few cases. This ensures that uh, your patient gets the best care uh, possible, but also gives you a confidence to get those first few cases under your belt. Start off with molars and premolars. Make a, make a surgical guide. Uh, use, the, uh, use that to then uh, uh, for the positioning of your initial osteotomy. And you can use a CBCT if you'd like, but as you become more comfortable with the molars and you work towards the premolars, you're already working in the posterior region. What a great time to learn indirect sinus lift. As we move to the interiors, we can start thinking about immediates and we can start using the fully guided protocol. Again, we wanna have the experience to make sure we don't get stuck in a hard spot if the fully guided protocol doesn't work, but we still wanna use that as an adjunct to improve our efficiency, our, our accuracy and our precision. Or as Dr. Sheik recommended, start off with an immediate molar. And then you can get into overdentures. There's no right or wrong way of doing this. This was one of the ways I did it and uh, uh, I think it's a good way of getting into implant dentistry. As, you're, as you do more and more cases, uh, you're getting to learn how to manage soft tissue, and, and that's very important to long-term success. You may come across some complications, hopefully not too many because you're selecting your cases appro appropriately, but you learn how to manage these. And then with those skills, you can slowly start working towards more advanced cases. Barriers to taking CE. The number one question I get is, how did you spend so much money on CE? Well, it's all in the way you look at it. We spent $100,000, $300,000, depending on the school you went to, 
in getting dental uh, education and being able to practice as a great profession. But what about spending a small fraction of that to open up yourself to a whole new world of dentistry, which is implant dentistry? Um, also, with the cost, I already mentioned, if you plan your cases and you have cases set up, so I would take a CE course and I would have a case set up right away that following week. So you, you get the uh, return on this investment really quickly. And then the more uh, fun aspect of taking a CE is that um, I took it in cities that I was going to be going to anyway. So a lot of my CE was in Toronto. Being from Windsor, I was going to go there to hang out with friends and family anyway. So I took these courses and I was able to then write off my travel to and from these courses. So that's uh, another uh, key thing to keep in mind. Time. As associates, we sometimes don't have the time or don't feel like we have the time because we have to work. And I understand that. I get that but have a conversation with your principal so that they understand the value you will bring back to their clinic by letting, uh, by letting you go and take the CE. Another thing about time is as we're starting out, we aren't as productive as we wanna be. So the first few years, you're not billing huge numbers. You may start out billing a few hundred dollars an hour. Later on, you end up billing a lot more in an hour. And what, that, what happens with that is it costs a lot more to take the downtime to take CE. So I strongly encourage you to take CE early in your careers. Patients, we discussed on how to set them up to get them to your courses. Uh, start talking to them during the recare exams, during restorative, anytime you're taking out a tooth, do soccer preservation. Lay that foundation for them to want and understand implant treatment. The next biggest question I always get is confusion. There are so many implant systems out there. There are so many different courses. What should I take? Well, to me, that answer is actually very simple. What are you restoring? What is your principal or mentor placing? And what is around you? Once you've answered that question, and hopefully you're dealing with a premium dental company who has a lot of resources, have a good relationship with your sales rep. That plays a very key role to, especially my uh, uh, journey this far. So a special shout out to Elaine Ratcliffe from Dent Supply Serona. A lot of the courses that I showed you I took through her. She encouraged us to learn more so that we could do implants at a higher level. And that's just a small fraction of the courses we took. She's, she's organized a lot of courses for us. So I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing without her. So thank you. Now we have the CE. How are we going to implement what we learned on Friday, Saturday, Sunday? So we need the patients. You need to be working on your case acceptance and case presentation is a key fact of that. But that's not only when it comes to implant dentistry, you're also learning on how to present during uh, crown treatments, during restorative. So sit at eye level, talk slow. That last part is very hard for me. For the last 30 years, I've been talking at 100 miles an hour, so I had to slow down. Educate your patients. This is another key step as to why I feel I've been able to place so many implants. I spend a lot of time talking to my patients. My consults are at the end of the day, so there's no pressure, and I let them ask all the questions. I get them comfortable with this type of treatment. For finances, there's a barrier for a lot of patients, and I place implants at the uh, regular fee guide, uh, the recommended uh, fees, uh, but I do offer payment plans, and maybe you can use prepayment. So if you're placing implants in three or four months, have them do prepayments every month. When the amount is there, you can go ahead and do the surgery and same thing for restorative. There's also third party companies, which I haven't used, but I've heard, I've heard okay things about as well. So you take the course on the weekend, you now have this really nice, expensive, shiny equipment sitting in your office. Don't let it collect dust, practice with it. You don't need patients to get familiar with your equipment. Train your staff on the same equipment because you may be the only dentist in the office who is offering this type of treatment. So you need to educate them as well. They will help you during the placement of implants. And more importantly, if you educate them well, they're actually going to help in your case acceptance for implant treatment. Confidence, we already talked about the benefits of having a mentor, mentors or being involved in a mentorship program. You can buy models online off of eBay or Amazon and just use the implant kit and practice getting familiar with the motions of placing an implant. Use digital dentistry as an adjunct. Rely on it so that you can be more confident in planning your implants and printing your guides and restoring your implants. So 
what's in your toolbox? We have all this CE and this is literally and figuratively my, my toolkit. This is what I use to go from office to office uh, placing implants. And uh, it's a representation of everything that I've learned from my mentors, from my experiences, from my CE. It also contains the equipment that I use as well. I'm constantly looking back at it and saying, what do I need to add? So make sure you're always adding to your skills. With implant placement, Dr. Shake brought up a good point where having a little inventory of implants helps. Uh, you don't need to have a couple hundred uh, like we do here. Uh, have a couple. If you're placing one implant to have one or two sizes above, one or two sizes below, and that will help address any complications during the implant procedure. A lot of speakers have done great jobs in terms of talking about treatment planning, uh, in terms of placement of implants. Uh, Dr. Zim's um, 12 and a half steps was mind blowing and, and I've been reviewing that as well. So I suggest everyone check that out. Uh, it's on Dentistry Academy's uh, YouTube page. Uh, but more importantly, I want to go over the just basic foundations from a beginner standpoint. By me being able to understand and appreciate this earlier on, I was able to drastically increase the speed at which I was able to place implants. First thing was I got used to my surgical kit. I got very comfortable with the different components of this. So spend some time doing that. Uh, each, uh, each implant company uses uh, slightly different protocols, but the fundamental of implant dentistry concepts don't change. So the more familiar you are with this, the less you have to think about uh, on the day of surgery. And I also read the surgical manual that comes with my kit. It would be my bedtime reading before any of my implant cases. So that way it's just one less thing to think about. Again, you might be the only person in the office familiar with pacing implants. You might have to train your assistant. So get familiar with your implant motor, get familiar with your armamentarium. So you're not focused on anything else other than just the implant placement at the, at the day of surgery. This is some, uh, just some basic pre-op. Uh, I like to do a chlorhexidine rinse. Uh, we give a little bit of ibuprofen for uh, post-op management. We give it right before the procedure. And if we're sedating them, we make sure they have a ride home. Dr. Tina did a great job in the first lecture in this series of the Dental Fast Track series. Uh, and her video is up on YouTube as well, uh, Dentistry Academy. I strongly encourage everyone to watch that to learn more about uh, flap design and suturing. So let's say we start off with a basic uh, molar case. We wanna make sure we do a mid-crestal mid incision, be mindful of where the keratinized tissue is, and you can adapt that accordingly depending on where you make your incision. Main thing is be confident when you make these incisions. Uh, go right to bone. Do not turn this into uh, a piece of meat. Uh, it will bleed more and will affect your visibility and your ability to perform surgery. Now that we have access to the site, let's prepare the osteotomy. Let's confirm the seating of our guide. I use either a round burr or a precision drill to go ahead and make a dimple in the uh, crestal in the cortical bone. And what this does is it gives me a path for my uh, twist drill uh, to go to and it won't be uh, moving around when we start. Know your drill lengths. Every surgical kit, every company uses different markings, so become comfortable with that. Be aware of the one millimeter that some companies don't account for. So that becomes very important when you're working around uh, different uh, vital, uh, vital anatomy. Drill speed. When I started out, I was more comfortable with a lower drill speed. The main point is here, here is make sure you have lots of irrigation for the bone. Make sure it's always on high. That way uh, you don't have any issues with the bone overheating. Guide pin. This is something that doesn't matter how I treatment plan my case, whether I'm using digital dentistry, a CBCP, or a guide, I always stop to use a guide pin. It just helps me check my angulation. It helps me uh, uh, articulate with the opposing tooth. So I'll have a patient close slightly so I know where the uh, implant crown will, will, will be and where the axis is going to be. And at this point, if we need to make any changes, we can go ahead and use a Lindemann uh, drill, which allows you to change the position and angulation of your, uh, of your uh, of osteotomy. And also, uh, one thing to uh, point out, you're not drilling to full length when you're using this guide pin. It's just uh, five or six millimeters. Once you're happy with it, you then drill to uh, full depth. So you're going to sequentially increase the osteotomy by going through your twist drills. Most cases, uh, most surgical kits, I should say, 
have a map for you to follow depending on the size of implant you're placing and the type of bone you're placing in it. As you become more comfortable, you start to change things up a little bit. A lot of kids also have cortical bone preparation. That bone is usually a little bit more dense. So sometimes that can bind the implant from seeding all the way. So you wanna make sure you're aware of that as well. And then we go ahead and place the implant. So we remove it, we bring it to the osteotomy site. We're very careful that the patient has some gauze or something so that they don't swallow it in case it falls. And uh, the key take home in all of this, if there's one thing you can learn from this lecture is make sure you look at your motor and that you have changed the RPM from 1200 or 1100, whatever you're doing the osteotomies at to a lower number, 15, 20, 25, so you can do the implant placement. You do not want to place an implant at a thousand, thousand RPM. For the last few millimeters of the seating, I use a manual torque wrench. This helps me with the dexterity and it just gives me confidence. I like the way it feels. Uh, one thing I, I uh, did mention early on with one of the cases, I do place my implants uh, slightly subcrestal and we, we are able to retain the bone a little bit better long term. So now the implant's in and what do we do with it next? So the gold standard is the insertion torque, uh, 35 newton centimeters or greater is what we look for. Depending on the system and comfort level, you're sometimes looking at slightly lower numbers. I wanted another objective way to be able to determine the next step. And that's where something like the Penguin comes in. This is a device that uses radio frequency analysis to measure the ISQ or implant stability quotient. And this gives us an objective way to make decisions regarding our treatment. Depending on the number, we may be placing a cover screw. Depending on uh, where the number is, we may wanna do a healing abutment, or if it's above 70, we can go ahead and restore it and feel confident in that. Typically 75 and above is what we're looking for. Post-op, so this is basic stuff, but anytime a patient walks into my office and leaves, I'm always focused on making sure they have a positive experience. And for me, that's things like giving them a cold compression pack the moment the surgery is done. Once they're, once they're all cleaned up, they'll have an ice pack and it's, it's on the area of the site and that helps with swelling and post-op pain. We're going over the post-ops. They have my cell phone number to give me a call. And another key to all this is I call them the night of uh, the procedure. And there's a, a few reasons why I do that. One, I wanna make sure they're doing okay and answer any questions they have. I review the post-op so I have less complications. Uh, th at this time, they're also not as sore as they're gonna be the next day or the following day. So they like you a little bit more at this time. And then ultimately they end up uh, thinking you're the best dentist in the world for calling them the same night to check on them. So I hope I shed some light on getting into implant dentistry and I want everyone to take away a few things. So make sure you continue to invest in yourself. The more you put into this profession, the more you get out of it. And, and I promise you, I've gotten a lot out of it in the last two years with implant dentistry just because of the sheer time and, and energy I put into it. Also, your patients ultimately benefit from this result. This is a lifelong journey. Yeah, I placed a few hundred implants in two years, everyone's journey is gonna be slightly different. For some, that may be going a little bit slower and that's okay. Focus on quality, not quantity. Uh, Dr. Chris Finelli said a really key uh, thing yesterday where he was saying, be aware of your reputation. And especially when you're starting out, you don't wanna be doing uh, a dentistry that you're not comfortable with doing. It can negatively impact your career in the future. So make sure everything you do that you can stand by and it's done at the highest level. And the most important thing, the reason we're able to practice great, this great profession is because of the care we provide to our patients. So make sure you're always offering them the highest level of care possible. For a lot of the mentorship courses that I talked about, you can check out Dentistry Academy's uh, website under the courses heading, and they will be listed there. Otherwise, thank you so much for your attention. I hope you gained one or two things out of this lecture. Good luck on your journey. If there's any way I can help you on your journey, feel free to reach out. Thank you so much.